Monday's BGP hijacking wasn't hijacking at all, but rather a fumbled upgrade in an ISP. The white company's Operation Shaheen is a nation-state espionage campaign directed against Pakistan's military. Sleazy gamer and hacker Swatistic pleads guilty to Wichita swatting charges and to bomb threats just about everywhere else. And the NPPD will soon become CISA and the lead U.S. civilian cybersecurity agency. A few words from our sponsor, Silence. They're the people who protect our own endpoints here at the CyberWire, and you might consider seeing what Silence can do for you. You probably know all about legacy antivirus protection. It's very good as far as it goes, but guess what? The bad guys know all about it, too. It will stop the skids, but to keep the savvier hood's hands off your endpoints, Silence thinks you need something better. They've just introduced version 2.3 of Silence Optics, it turns every endpoint into its own security operations center. Silence Optics deploys algorithms formed by machine learning to offer not only immediate protection, but security that's quick enough to keep up with the threat by watching, learning, and acting on systems behavior and resources. Whether you're worried about advanced malware, commodity hacking, or malicious insiders, Silence Optics can help. Visit Silence.com to learn more. And we thank Silence for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, November 14th, 2018. We've seen some jitters recently over the prospect of Border Gateway Protocol, that's BGP hijacking, the concern is that it could reroute traffic through nodes where it might be subjected to sniffing and inspection, in short, subjected to the ministrations of an intelligence service. There was a BGP leak Monday that for a bit more than an hour routed traffic through China and to a lesser extent through Russia and Nigeria. As Security Week summarized the incident, traffic from Google Search, G Suite and Google Cloud services was directed through Trans Telecom in Russia, Nigerian ISP Main One, and China Telecom. The unusual routing was reported by the network monitoring company Thousand Eyes, which said the incident had little effect on consumer ISPs, but was very much noticed by business-grade service providers. For those users, it amounted to a denial-of-service condition, rendering their access to the affected Google services difficult, if not impossible. The incident aroused suspicions immediately, Traffic unexpectedly transiting China and Russia raises red flags of espionage warning. But in this case, it appears nothing of the kind was afoot. The incident now appears to have been the result of an error and not a malicious campaign. A misconfiguration in a Nigerian ISP seems to have caused the rerouting. As Wired puts it, the traffic wasn't hijacked, but it was out of control. Yesterday, the Nigerian ISP Main One copped to being the one to cause the problem, Quote, this was an error during a planned network upgrade due to a misconfiguration on our BGP filters, end quote. They added that they were able to fix the error within 74 minutes. There are a few familiar lessons worth drawing from the episode. First, the tightly connected nature of the Internet can be a source of weakness as well as robustness. Second, failure to follow best practices can have severe and cascading effects. And finally, not everything that looks like an attack is an attack, so reticence about attribution is sound policy. Security firm Silence is describing a nation-state espionage campaign. It's unusually sophisticated, prepped, staged, evasive, and quiet, and it's targeting Pakistan's military, especially the Air Force. Silence researchers call the campaign Operation Shaheen, after the Shaheen Falcon that serves as the emblem and mascot of Pakistan's Air Force. They call the threat actor the White Company because of the degree of care it takes to cover, to whitewash, its activities. Silence evaluates the White Company as a nation-state actor, but with customary reticence they don't say which nation-state that might be. Global accounting firm BDO recently released their 2018 Telecommunications Risk Factor Survey, And the results had some surprising revelations when it came to cybersecurity. Gregory Garrett is head of the U.S. and international cybersecurity practice for BDO. 
Well, I think it's more of what wasn't said uh, than what was said. Candidly, what we expected was to see cybersecurity reflected as a significant risk factor in the assessments from the various companies that we surveyed. Uh, But rather, what we saw was what we'd call the the typical uh, factors in the industry, things like exchange rates, increased competition, growing interest rates, new technologies, and access to finance, cybersecurity didn't even show up in the top five. And so uh, kind of reading the tea leaves there, I mean, what do you think that points to? Prompted, I'll say, a number of discussions amongst our colleagues, and and I'll say I've had to reflect on um, a lot of industry conversations I've had. And so what what I've concluded is there's really two... I'll say groups of telecoms and how they look at cybersecurity in today's environment. You know, one is the the very sophisticated players uh, who have made significant investments in enhancing their cybersecurity over the co- past couple of years from uh, monitoring detection and response services, uh, multi-factor authentication, layered defenses, the use of artificial intelligence in their monitoring you know, the kinds of things that you would expect that a world-class company would do in this space that could potentially have significant attacks. Then, then there's the others. And unfortunately, I've, I've chatted with more than a few that because of the increased competition, uh, the increased exchange rates and effects on uh, their industries, that I've seen just the opposite with a significant number of telecom companies where they've actually significantly underinvested in cybersecurity. You know, they're doing minimal monitoring, not even on a 24 by 7 basis. Uh, they have not made the investments that you would expect a big clear, a carrier class networks and internet service providers to provide uh, from a multi factor authentication to even the level of education and training of their employees. Just one observation here. One of the questions I always ask is uh, when I'm talking with senior executives is what percentage of their overall IT spend are they spending specifically on information security? Over the years, I've seen this evolve and it does vary by industry sector uh, with, for example, financial services, and healthcare industries at a much higher end than I'll say the average retail company. But typically I've found that telecommunications are usually in the three to 5% range of their overall IT budget. And what I've found sort of alarming is there's two groups. There's the group that invest at the 5% and higher. And then there's the group that invest at the 1% or lower and there's actually very few of the major, you know, carrier class companies that are operating in the three to five percent sort of typical range. I don't know. It strikes me as being short-sighted, certainly, but uh, I can't help thinking it's a pay me now or pay me later kind of situation. Well, it, it absolutely is, and unfortunately, Dave, I, I wish I could say this is the only industry where I've seen that behavior, but it's really not. You know, I've seen it in financial institutions. I've also seen it in healthcare. I've seen it in critical infrastructure, where you have the what I'll call the world class companies uh, really making significant investments and and really amping up their uh, cyber defenses in a very significant and meaningful kind of way. And then you've got the mid tier companies, and we're seeing a lot of them that are significantly underinvested in cybersecurity across all the different industries. You know, and, and many of them, it's, uh, you know, they're looking to maximize profitability. This is a cost. This is investment. If they haven't experienced a significant breach, uh, then they're only doing what they have to minimally do to be compliant with regulatory standards and, and just hoping and praying that um, a big attack doesn't, you know, affect them. That's Gregory Garrett from BDO. The report is the 2018 Telecommunications Risk Factor Survey, You can find that on the BDO website. Tyler Barris pled guilty to federal charges related to his involvement in a Kansas man's swatting death last year. 
The U.S. Department of Justice says Mr. Barris acknowledged guilt on one count each of making a false report resulting in a death, of cyber-stalking, and of conspiracy. It's believed he'll receive at least 20 years in prison. Mr. Barris, who went by the hacker name Swatistic, was an unusually active participant in swatting and other dangerous capers, bomb threats, and so on. The three counts mentioned above are just the ones he was involved with that had their sad outcome in Wichita, Kansas. He also copped to guilty pleas for hoax bomb threats to FBI and FCC headquarters, the latter because he was a fan of net neutrality and because the obvious way to put your policy views before the government is by telling people there's a bomb at a government office. In the Central District of California, his home state, he was unusually active and faced 46 counts that included, the Department of Justice said, making calls with false reports that bombs were planted at high schools, universities, shopping malls, and TV stations. He made the calls from Los Angeles to emergency numbers in Ohio, New Hampshire, Nevada, Massachusetts, Illinois, Utah, Virginia, Texas, Arizona, Missouri, Maine, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, New York, Michigan, Florida, and Canada. End quote. The crimes to which Mr. Barris admitted are deeply repellent. He got a completely uninvolved man killed just for the lulls and to put some other gamers in their place. Many have remarked not only on his striking lack of insight into the consequences of his actions, but also for his striking lack of remorse. He continued woofing online while in jail awaiting his day in court, taking advantage of some technical loophole he'd discovered to get Internet access from within the facility. Mr. Barris is 25, which makes him the graybeard of the trio charged in connection with the Wichita swatting. The other two, Call of Duty gamers who had a falling out, are Jason Viner, 18, of North College Hill, Ohio, and Shane Gaskell, 20, of Wichita, Kansas. Those two are still awaiting trial. They're involved because Mr. Viner asked Mr. Barris to SWAT Mr. Gaskill, and Mr. Barris sent the SWAT team to Mr. Gaskill's former address, since occupied by the late and innocent Andrew Finch. We mention this case not because cases of accidental negligent death are so rare as to be noteworthy. Alas, while they're not commonplace, they're not unheard of either. Rather, this case merits attention because of the way it illustrates the strained disinhibition that seems to lie beneath so much misconduct in cyberspace. And finally, to turn from sordid skid crime to something more pleasant, to the gratification of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Congress has passed legislation to re-establish the Department's National Protection and Programs Directorate as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the CISA. Once the President signs the bill, CISA will become the lead U.S. civilian cybersecurity agency. And now a bit about our sponsors at VMware. Their trust network for Workspace ONE can help you secure your enterprise with tested best practices. They've got eight critical capabilities to help you protect, detect, and remediate. A single open platform approach, data loss prevention policies, and contextual policies get you started. They'll help you move on to protecting applications, access management, and encryption. And they'll round out what they can do for you with micro-segmentation and analytics. VMware's white paper on a comprehensive approach to security across the digital workspace will take you through the details and much more. You'll find it at thecyberwire.com slash VMware. See what Workspace ONE can do for your enterprise security. Thecyberwire.com slash VMware. And we thank VMware for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Emily Wilson. She is the Fraud Intelligence Manager at Terbium Labs. Emily, welcome back. Uh, over at Terbium, you all released a white paper recently, and it's titled The Truth About Dark Web Pricing. Uh, let's walk through this. So what prompted you all to uh, create this uh, report? Originally, it started off as a project to do a meta-analysis of the pricing reports about the dark web available uh, in the security industry, right? Every so often... A security company will put out a report which will include some pricing information about dark web goods and services. And we were curious to see what, what we could gather from that information doing a meta-analysis of those prices over time. Hmm. And it quickly turned into a slightly different project because we discovered that the data was really very inconsistent and the prices were 
anecdotal at best. There was not a lot of methodology. And so it turned into what we have here, which is a white paper addressing some of the issues the industry is is facing and honestly that the industry is creating for itself by having less than rigorous standards in talking about dark web pricing. Well, let's explore that some. I mean, the title of it is The Truth About Dark Web Pricing, which uh, is a bit provocative. I, I indicates that maybe we haven't had the truth up to this point. I don't think we've had the truth, or rather, I, I don't think we've gotten past a very surface level conversation, right? The, the things that we do see are, here's how cheap your social security number is, or here's how, and uh, I won't name names, but there was a particular report that came out where the prices, you know, is the, the cost of your identity on the dark web and the prices were vastly overstated. Something like a bank account costs $500. It costs a, a tenth of that price, hmm. Right. Um, and so we, we get these, these headlines, we get these one-off stories, and instead of using those to have a bigger conversation about the well-developed fraud economy or the way that goods and services change over time, uh, or even what drives value, what drives these prices on the dark web, and does it matter how much something is different from one market to another, we just get stuck on that first thing, and we never really get to the truth of it because we're too caught up in the the flash and the sexy headlines. It is this a case of, of someone who has something to sell you, trying to to scare you into thinking that, that something's more valuable than it actually is? Sure. Fear is a very effective tactic. There's a reason that so many vendors in the security industry rely on selling you fear. You create a problem and then you invent a solution for it and you make everyone feel better because you'll keep them safe. We really need to move beyond that, right? We know that data can't be fully secured. We know that there's going to be a data compromise. We know that systems are going to come under attack and we need to start there. And so in that same way, as we've matured that that view of what the security industry needs to look like and how it needs to help supply solutions, we need to move beyond this very basic, you know, look at this bright and shiny headline of a price without context or information or discussion of what the potential fallouts are, that it's so easy to buy infant socials or credit reports or W-2s or Facebook accounts on the dark web. So what is the truth about dark web pricing? What's uh, what's the take home from it? The truth about dark web pricing is we don't have a good sense of it yet. Hmm. And that's a problem, right? The white paper in it, we propose that we need to develop a shared taxonomy to begin to uh, to look at these things more consistently, right? If you have 30 descriptions of a credit card across a bunch of different reports, how many of those are actually different from one another? There aren't going to be 30 different categories of credit cards for us to look at that are being sold on the dark web. There might be six, hmm. you know, how many variables matter? We know that freshness and validity drive dark web pricing. That makes sense. Something that's newer that you can cash out more easily. Those are important. But what about the difference in pricing between a, a business credit card versus a platinum credit card, right? Hmm. How do we think about the valuation between prepaid cards and gift cards? How do we measure price fluctuations throughout the year? You know, when is it that the W-2s start to come on the market and how long after tax season are they still available? Mm. You know, we're not, um, we're not as an industry gathering enough data and we're not looking at this in a consistent enough way that we can actually tell those stories yet. It's a difficult problem. Collecting on the dark web is hard. It, it changes very quickly. There's a lot of nuance. Uh, and it's going to take a full industry lift to actually look at this, and that's what we're proposing. All right. Well, uh, the uh, the white paper is titled The Truth About Dark Web Pricing. It's over on the Terbium Labs website. Emily Wilson, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit Silance.com. And Silance is not just a sponsor, we actually use their products to help protect our systems here at the CyberWire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace One Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Iben, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.